everybody, my wife here with yet another edition of Amiga Retro Games. Uh, I believe this is episode 4, season 2. It's been a while since we did the last one. But, uh, no, it's not. It's episode 5. Oh, it's one of the boomers, anyway, whenever I ever recorded this one. <laughs> anyway, this time around we're going to, well, let us introduce it itself. Monday Biden's Flying Circus. Yes, we're doing Monty Python, the f Flying Circus, the computer game. Yeah. Weird, huh? Okay. What was it? Anyway, let's see. In 1991, Virgin Mastertronic, who later on became Virgin Interactive, the international software arm of Virgin Records, released Monty Python's Flying Circus, the computer game. It's an action arcade style game that was available for the PC, the Amiga. Commodore 64 and the Atari ST. In it, you control DP, gr sorry, DP Gumby, through a labyrinth of Python-related obstacles and traps. The objective, well, Mr. Gumby, is in search of his brain, of course. Alas, the game is very hard to come by these days, as Virgin Mastertronic doesn't exist. They did at one point re recognize themselves as Virgin Interactive. But then again, they went their way of the dodo as well, blah, 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 blah. Old story with Virgin, we know that, yeah. About the game itself. Although on the Amiga the game takes up a mere 630k... 630k, folks. It is a challenging, rip-roar... and rip-roaringly funny. Before starting, the player must identify, though, two types of cheese. It's really, a, actually, a copy protection scheme involving pictures of cheese, which the player must match with pictures found in the game's instruction manual. Then the real fun begins. The player plot... Sorry, the player must pilot Mr. DP Gumby through a countless number of Python obstacles, e.g. cheese, spam, vikings, dead parrots, keep left signs, the Spanish Inquisition, half bees, oh, so soft cushions, etc, etc. The objective is to find all four pieces of Mr. Gumby's missing brain. Because each level takes place in, then, we should say, rather unusual you know, uh, Gilliam-esque envir environment, Mr. Gumby is surgically altered. In the first level, he wakes up on the body of a fish to swim through the underwater caverns. To defend himself, Mr. Gumby must also throw fish, probably halibut, of course, being python, at oncoming dangers and obstacles. Along the way, though, Mr. Gumby collects Cans of spam sausages. Spam, 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 spam. You can't just forget that song. Um, sausages, eggs, baked beans, and spam. Did I mention spam? Lots of spam is involved in this game. At the end of each level, Mr. Gumby vomits all of his food into a big hole. And if he regurgitates at least 16 cans of spam, he gets a piece of his brain back. Also, as a bonus. Uh, sorry, as a bonus round, Mr. Gumby gets to play Augment, uh, sorry, Argument Clinic with the Minister for, politic, uh, for Pointless Arguments. In it, Mr. Gumby must contradict everything the Minister says be, be, uh, by moving Mr. Gumby's cartoon text balloon in the opposite direction of that of the Minister's. Agree with the Minister or hesitate too long and the Minister calls time and the bonus round is uh, subsequently over. The weirdest thing about the game is the scoring actually starts at 99,999,999 points and counts down. The lower the score is, the better you've done. Sound silly enough for you? Anyway, <laughs> watch the footage, it's pretty funny, folks. A little bit of history into the Monty Python Flying Circus game, released in 1991 by Virgin Mastertronics, who later became Virgin Interactive, so... Oh, and it was released on the Amiga, the STU, Commodore, I've mentioned all that crap. Anyway, stay tuned, folks. More to come.
wait is over. The universe has finally expanded. Experience five generations of the final frontier like never before. Featuring a new dynamic interface. Remastered music and effects. A myriad of new ships, mission maps, and races. And a fully working multiplayer system. Boldly go where no one has gone before. Chris Jones Gaming proudly presents Star Trek Legacy The Ultimate Universe Version 1.0 For more information, visit www.ultimateuniversemod.net Welcome back. I hope that advert... Well, most of you have seen that advert anyway on various video sites, but I thought I'd throw it in there just to give a chance for people to get a cup of tea. Second game we're going to do. Very, very good game this was. Classic game. It's known as... Well, it goes into two titles. It was sometimes known as UFO. And it, uh, sorry, XCOM UFO Defense, but its original title was UFO Enemy Unknown. And it's a video game created by Julian Gollop and published by Microprose back in 1993. It was the first in the XCOM series as well, which has spawned off many, many, many subsequent uh, spin-offs from it. The idea of XCOM uh, begins in 19... the story, I mean, begins in 1998. The initial plot centers around increased reports of UFO sightings. Tales of abduction and terrorism by unknown aliens become widespread. The nations of the world come to perceive this as a threat and attempt to form their own forces to deal with this, such as Japan's um, Kirukai. These forces, fa uh, such as Kirukai, these forces fail miserably. The Kirukai not intercepting a single UFO in its five months of operation. On December 11th, 1998, representatives of some of the most powerful nations in the world meet in Geneva, Switzerland, to discuss the issue. From this meeting was born the Extraterrestrial Combat Unit, XCOM, who the player controls in the course of the game. The game actually picks up on January 1st, 1999. XCOM's first base becomes operational, beginning what would later become known as the First Alien War, a period of time lasting three years. Hundreds of UFOs were intercepted, but the forces sent to clean up the crash sites took heavy casualties. Major cities came under attack by alien forces, and at one point, alien forces even began establishing bases on Earth itself from the crash sites. Sorry, from the crash sites, however, valuable knowledge and technology were discovered. Aliens from several distinct species were captured and interrogated interrogated, technology was reversed engineered and put to use by the XCOM forces. In later years, the major breakthrough came and interrogation revealed the aliens forces were based on Cydonia, in, sorry, in Cydonia on the planet Mars. A heavily armed and armored strike force is sent to Mars in XCOM's Avenger craft, based on alien technology, and managed to destroy the alien brain creature that was apparently responsible for masterminding the entire operation. Shortly before the Cydonian base was destroyed, however, a mysterious transmission was beamed back to Earth from the wreckage of the base, setting the stage for the sequel, Terror from the Deep. So what is this? I mean, you've just had the basic synopsis of the story there. So what is it? It's a single-player game, turn-based, very unique for its time. 
Um, the player starts by choosing their location on the Geoscape. And the Geoscape is, is a re representation of the world which displays XCOM bases and craft. UFOs, alien bases, sites of alien activity, alien terror sites, etc. Uh, etc. Et the player can choose from here to deploy XCOM craft to either patrol the designated locations, intercept UFOs, or land at a UFO crash site. Landed UFO terror site, etc. etc. Base, etc. Right. Clicking on the base of the Geoscape takes it to a player base screen. From here the player can purchase weapons and other equipment, recruit soldiers, scientists, engineers, build expansions to the bases, uh, build new bases entirely, you can have up to eight in total, and organize research and production. Your typical turn-based game basically, a similar, I, I think the best way you could describe it in the concept of gameplay itself is very similar to the Sid Meier's series. Funding for is also uh, provided by 10 founding nations of XCOM. At the end of each month, a funding report is provided where the nations can choose to increase or decrease their level of funding based on the perceived project, uh, progress of the XCOM project. Alternatively, a nation can sign up a pact with aliens which results in a withdrawal of all funding by that nation. So it depends on how your progress goes, depending on how much dull you, you know, dosh you've got to actually spin around to actually research your stuff and buy recruits, etc. When a craft is sent to land at a UFO crash site, landed UFO or Terra alien site, the game shifts into a tactical phase known as the Battlescape. Here the player commands their soldiers against the alien forces in an isometric turn-based battle sequence. One of the three outcomes is possible in each phase. Either the XCOM forces are eliminated, the alien forces are eliminated, the player chooses to, or the player chooses to withdraw. These battles lead to the recovery of alien artifacts which can then be researched and possibly reproduced at the XCOM bases and also can lead to the recovery of live aliens which may, which may then be assigned as a research project to produce information, possibly leading to new technology. The game may end in several ways though. If the player's performance as judged by the founding nations is poor uh, for two consecutive months, the player runs into deficit for two, or the player runs into deficit for two consecutive months, or all of the player's bases are captured and they get, you know, they captured, they are captured or destroyed, the game ends in defeat. If the player mounts an assault on Alien's primary bases and loses, the game also ends in, defe in defeat. If, however, the player is victorious in the final assault, the game ends in victory. Now, some of the technical details of uh, UFO Enemy Unknown. The DOS version of UFO uh, makes use of the VGA graphics card, synthesized music and digital sound effects. It supported the Sound Blaster, Adlib and Roland LP LAPC cards. The 1.4 patch replaces several sound effects and adds, sub adds support for additional sound cards including the Gravis Ultrasound, Media Vision, Pro Audio Spectrum and obviously general MIDI devices. Unofficial game editing software is available, allowing players to change the quantities of weapons and equipment and change the standard maps and layouts of UFOs that were provided within the game. So there, there was, it's abandoned where now, but there is plenty of stuff still out there where you can actually manipulate the game and it works on most stuff. It certainly works on DOSBox with the um, DOS version. Uh, obviously with the Amiga version and the ST version etc that wasn't necessary. All the wonderful you know, technology was built straight in. Um, <coughs> speaking of which, the OCS, ECS and the Amiga AGA version as well as the PlayStation versions featured higher quality music and the latter is compatible um, is, sorry, it's compatible with the PlayStation mouse. Uh, it requires a whole memory, uh, sorry, it requires a whole memory card for the Battlescape save games. A whole memory card on the PlayStation version, folks. Uh, and the same also applied to, it, to the sequel on the PlayStation version. Anyway, the history and the sequels of this game. Conceived by Julian Glo Gollop. What a name, Julian Gollop. I bet he was bullied at school. Anyway, uh, as a sequel to an earlier game he did called Laser Squad. The game was picked up by Microprose and published in Europe and Australia as UFO Enemy Unknown and in North America as XCOM UFO Defense. Uh, there were no expansion packs for UFO Defense, but several sequels were. Uh, UF, uh, sorry, XCOM Terror from the Deep was the first sequel to the XCOM game and was developed in-house by Microprose. XCOM Apocalypse, hello spy. Yeah. He knows that one. Um, was a new game developed by Gollop, uh, the Gollop Brothers, 
and was set in a single city rather than an entire planet. It featured very similar gameplay to the prior games, uh, albeit with both turn-based and in real-time combat. This was the last XCOM developed game by the Gollop Brothers. XCOM Interceptor, the next sequel, was a flight simulator set in deep space with some strategy and research elements similar to the original XCOM games, uh, but also contained real-time flight simulator very similar to the games like TIE Fighter and uh, X-Wing and all that lot at the time. XCOM Enforcer, which proved not to be very popular, is a third-person shooter with very different gameplay to the rest of the series. XCOM Genesis planned to be the rebirth of the strategy roots of the game series. It was started in 1999 but was cancelled by Hasbro Interactive later that year. The games from XCOM series have been sold in a different in different packages as they were released in later years, the most notable of which was a combination of the first five games, UFO, Enemy Unknown, or Defensive Viewer in the States, Terror from the Deep, Apocalypse, Internet Scepter, and Email Games. The intellectual property rights of the game series retained by the publisher and Gollop. Sorry, I'll start that sentence again. The intellectual property rights of the series were retained by the publisher and the Gollop po uh, brothers play no role in the series post-apocalypse. The game Laser Squad Nemesis, developed by independently by Nick and Julian Gollop, featured several similarities to the XCOM games. In 2005, a spiritual successor with an unrelated plotline to XCOM was released for the Nintendo Game Boy Advance titled Rebel Star Tactical Command and was again developed by the Gollop Brothers. The game saw uh, game's critical response. Though the premise for this game was simple, critics agreed that it was, that it was executed exceptionally well and the game became popular among strategy and war game fans for reasons such as excellent squad-based tactic in interface, the combination of tactical and strategic elements and the ability to discover and create new weaponry and other items. Another reason for the game's success is the strong sense of atmosphere that the games, in, that the games invoked. Soldiers were vulnerable to alien attacks even with armor, and the use of line of sight and opportunity to fire allows alien snipers attacks and ambushes. The enemy comes uh, in numerous shapes and forms, and the players run into new deadly aliens repeatedly without knowledge of their capabilities beforehand, which was very appealing for the games because they never knew what they were going to get face next. UFO Enemy Unknown, or XCOM Defense as it was known, was voted number one PC and Amiga game of all time by IGN, and number two video game in 1992 by Pellet. So, there we go folks, a little bit of the history of the XCOM series, starting with this game here, UFO Enemy Unknown. It was developed uh, by Mythos Games, it was published by Microprose, it was designed by Julian Gollop, it was available on the Amiga, DOS, PlayStation, and there was a Windows version as well. The release date on it was December 31st, 1993 for all the earlier platforms, and October 25th, 1995 for the PlayStation. It was a turn-based strategy game, it was a single-player game, and it was rated by Hellspur at 15+. plus. There you go, folks. That's uh, two great games there for you for this particular episode, and I hope you enjoyed the show. I'll see you in episode 6. Until then, this has been my wife. Take it easy, folks.